I hate to be standing between you and a drink, so um, I'll make this as fast talking as I can. Um, I'd like to thank Google very much for inviting me. Um, people in the travel industry, if you think Google has changed your world, welcome to the world of publishing. Um, it's all going terribly wrong. Uh, my name is Ben Schott. Um, I am the author of Shots Original Miscellany, Shots Food and Drink Miscellany, Shots Sporting Gaming and Idling Miscellany, Shots Almanac, and I write a um, daily blog for the New York Times. And amongst the many things that I've been called that I'm willing to say in public are information architect and picker up of unconsidered trifles. Um, Google's mission statement is to organize the world's information. My mission statement is to organize the information at a very small little hamlet somewhere, maybe Highgate, somewhere very small <laughs> and local. Um, I'm a huge believer in these three things, which I'm going to zip through this afternoon. Miscellany, taxonomy, and the illustration of data, and fuzziness. Together, for me, these suggest a way of looking at the world and of solving problems that may seem random and unlikely, but can offer curious and creative solutions. Now, I'm not necessarily going to give you the kind of direct answers that some of our excellent panelists have had, because this is not my field. But I'm a firm believer um, in something that Virginia Woolf said. Let us not take it for granted that life exists more fully in what is commonly thought big than what is commonly thought small. Because the joy, as well as the devil, is in the details, as Hieronymus Bosch knew so well. For design, and that can be product design, it can be information design, it can be the design of your websites, it can be the design of your logos, it's not in the details, it is the details. Whether it's the hidden arrow in the FedEx logo, has anyone else seen that before, the people? You'll never look at the FedEx logo again without thinking, damn, that's clever. <laughs> For me, this is, this is what I call a go-home early moment. I don't care what time of day. You're, if, if you were in the office at half eight in the morning and you came up with that, that's it. Nothing you do today is going to be as good as that. <laughs> it's, it's a genius. And the other sort of type of detail is, of course, NASA, who lost a $125 million Mars orbiter because two different engineering firms, one was working in metric and one was working in imperial. So, you know, it, it, it matters. It may be small, but it matters. One company that currently rejoices in the minute is Twitter. I have to say I'm hugely impressed by a company that's valued at a billion dollars but publicly admits to spending more money than it makes, which is the best euphemism I've ever heard. Um, I had to say I'm not a Google, um, sorry, I'm a Google fan. I'm not a Twitter uh, fanatic. Um, I think it's very interesting. We've heard a lot about social networking and about Twitter and about people's reliance on Twitter. And what's interesting for me is the role of Twitter in the news. If you take, for example, what happened in the Iranian elections, there was a tremendous sense that Twitter was a sort of social network and people, information was spilling out of the world through Twitter. And I think at the moment we're quite naive about social networking. And I think with things like the attacks in India and the post-election violence in Iran, I think the media especially are going to have to be slightly less, less breathless in reporting Twitter feeds directly. I think we have to realize that the bad guys can Twitter too. And I think we're in this optimistic stage of social networking where we somehow think it's lots of nice people like us. And just as we've seen earlier with the TripAdvisor example, you know, the bad guys can put up comments too and the bad guys can tweet too. And I think the media, the mass media, needs to be aware of this. I recently looked into Twitter for a piece that I did for the New York Times, which I'm going to zip through. Twitter, as you know, has a 140-character limit. But there's nothing new about new technology imposing restrictions on articulation and communication. SMS, for example, has 160 characters. Now, old-fashioned wireless telegraphy, dot, 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 beep, 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 dot, 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 traditionally had a limit of about 150 for the cheapest message. Why? Because they accepted words that were 10 letters long, dictionary words, mind you, and messages of, of oh, that should be 15, I'm sorry, that should be 15. Um, so there's 150 characters, and it's bizarre that telegraphy has 150, SMS has 160, and Twitter 140. There's something about this spread of communication. But what I discovered was that there was this huge boom in telegraphy codebooks. This is partly for economy and partly for secrecy. 
And what would happen is travelers, especially commercial travelers, would be in different parts of the world and they would want to communicate back home or to their colleagues or to the HQ. And so code books like this, the Anglo-American Telegraphic Code, published in 1891, the third edition, that popular, allowed people to use dictionary words, which was the only words that allowed. You couldn't create gibberish, they just wouldn't transmit it. Under 10 characters, so it came within that tight economic uh, restriction. And it allowed the communication of quite complicated phrases with a single word. And here are some of the some ones which I wrote for the New York Times, which I thought were more amusing. You can see I haven't made it up. That's an actual scan. A set. The single word meant he has met with a trifling accident. <laughs> Blockish. Allow for a liberal bonus. It's amazing how they resonate these days, isn't it? <laughs> Confuter. The prisoner will probably be condemned. Now, how many of you have needed to transmit that back to your offices when you've been abroad? <laughs> Crisp, can you recommend to me a good female cook? <laughs> One word and such a whole brilliant social milieu. Evidential, a gunpowder explosion has occurred. <laughs> Bearing in mind, you're telegraphing this. It's got to go in a beep beep. Anyway. Flank, a fire is raging here. Please send an engine. Clearly, you'd send that after the explosion uh, of the gunpowder. Mightily, employ only as, only as many men as absolutely necessary in these tough times. Mightily is a key word for all of us. Rosalite, resistance is useless. Clearly, every evil baddie needs to be able to text, Twitter, or telegraph this one word. And I think my favorite is the word titmouse, which means I accept with pleasure your invitation to the theatre tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, what happens if it's the day after tomorrow? There's an actually another word for that. It's, it's astonishing. Secret codes are obviously the meat and drink of the Department of State. And I was recently browsing um, amongst some of their publications and came across some wonderful advice for travelers that the Department of State have kindly publicized. If you are caught in the middle of unrest, they say, do not take sides, which I think for the US Department of State is bloody cheeky. <laughs> if you are abroad when unrest begins, stay in your hotel and contact the embassy. If phones are down, hire someone to take a note. I say, my man, do not watch activity from your window. Choose a room that provides greater protection from gunfire, rocks, grenades, etc. So any of you, the e-book of people, could, it, could there be a scroll down menu? I want a hotel room that provides protection from, and you should be tick boxes, gunfire, yeah, grenades, rocks. The Department of State also offer useful advice for a bear attack. If you see a bear, they say, and can escape without being spotted, do so. Well, it's a good thing they told us. <laughs> do not shout, OK? If you cannot escape, show the bear you are human by waving your arms slowly and speaking to the bear, then back away. If attacked, shoot to kill at the heart. Brilliant. And continue firing until the bear is dead. <laughs> Don't take any risks with dead. They play dead. They're, they're... <laughs> Never try to outswim a bear. If confronted by a shark, the US State Department say, punch and kick at the animal's nose and eyes. Shout for help. <laughs> Raise one arm, but do not wave, as others on the beach may simply wave back. <laughs> so sharks reminded me of a piece of uh, wonderful information that I came across when researching uh, for the food and drink miscellany. There's this notion of what do foods taste like, and I came across a report that says shark tastes like tuna. Now, I thought everything tasted of chicken, but it turns out chicken tasted everything else. So shark apparently tasted tuna, so I did a bit more research and found out what other things taste like. Tapir tastes of beef. Water hair tastes of tapir, so presumably water hair tastes of beef and tapir tastes of water hair. Puma tastes of veal. Armadillo tastes of rabbit. Wombat tastes of pork. Baby wasp tastes of scrambled egg. I know this to be true because a friend of mine is from the Padang tribe of Burma and he's eaten baby wasps and said it's, it's an uncanny resemblance to scrambled eggs, especially the way that I cook them. The Nephila spider tastes of potato. Bat tastes of partridge. Termites taste of lettuce and so on and so forth. Hippopotamus tastes of beef. Not particularly exciting. You'd expect it somehow, but hippopotamuses are interesting because... Portuguese settlers in Africa during the 19th century didn't have enough to eat during Lent. And so the ecclesiastical authorities gave them special dispensation 
to eat hippo during Lent, because hippos spent so much time in water, they could technically be classified as fish. <laughs> Portuguese settlers brings me on to religious travelers, and we've had some very interesting discussions of travel trends, and I'm not going to compete with the experts with the data, but in, with my hat as someone who collects new words for the New York Times, these are some of the travel trends that I've come across, some of them a little bit more Rococo than the ones we've maybe heard before. Pilgrimages, I think, are dramatic and are going to increase being dramatic. The Hajj, particularly, is very interesting. It's a pilgrimage that um, all Muslims must make if they can and they are fit to. But what's interesting in the Hajj the numbers are so great, four million people travel to the Hajj, that it's now measured in pilgrims per minute. They can't even count them. It's just a sheer foot flow. And what's interesting about the Hajj is that these very complex and very ancient religious rituals made sense when a few thousand people did it, and maybe when a few hundred thousand people, but now millions of people are doing it. There's tremendous pressure on the religious authorities to change the ancient um, ceremonies of the Hajj because of the sheer force of numbers. We're also looking at shifts in people to things like Lourdes and, and uh, Lords and, and, and Stonehenge. But interesting things like Burning Man, what one might call secular pilgrimages, I think are going to be important. We also have the taxation vacation. I won't bore you with the booze cruise, currency exchange rates, shopping, sex in the city. There's still a shop um, in New York that sells uh, cupcakes, and it's packed in all weathers just because it featured uh, on sex in the city. It's amazing people will travel for cupcakes. Technology is uh, a key... Um, stimulus to travel, um, either because it allows you to search more or because people go specifically to buy products because they're new and out in America or in Japan or because they're cheaper. And of course, one of the great overused words of the year is the staycation and now the nacation, this notion that oil prices, currency fluctuations, political and economic insecurity um, have put people off. And also this notion of safe tourism. So, um, you know, avoiding South London, for example, just to be, just to be, just to be on the safe side. Climate sightseeing, see it before it goes. There's a certain irony of people traveling all the way to rainforests just to see them. Um, glaciers, and of course, Concorde. Um, I know several people who've paid to take one of the last few flights on Concorde, but things like foie gras is very interesting. People traveling in order to experience food that may be banned. I know people who traveled to certain states in America when foie gras was going to be banned almost as a protest against this. Offsetting, we've discussed, I won't go into any more detail, but this notion of taking only pictures and leaving only footprints, I think is going to be, as other speakers have said, an important aspect of ethical travel. Medical tourism, plastic surgery tourism, very big in, in America and in Thailand. Reproductive tourism, people going for fertility treatments, but also procreation vacations, people traveling to procreate, to conceive in a meaningful location. Yorkshire obviously springs to mind for many of you. Um, it used to be the case that if you wanted to play cricket for Yorkshire, uh, you had to be born in Yorkshire. Um, I think that's changed. But Siena is quite interesting. I don't know if people know Siena. Uh, it's a small Italian city-state with the Palio, a very famous horse race. And um, each of the horses in the Palio represents a different contrada, which is a sort of small area with sort of invisible borders, but you know if you're Sienese exactly where you are. Uh, and there are stories of women being almost dragged across Italy when they're about to give birth, so they could give birth, their child could be born in the right contrada, so they could support the right team when the palio came around. It's a very big deal. And when they couldn't travel, either because they were abroad or they just wasn't, they just said, you've got to be kidding, um, earth would be brought in and placed under the bed so the child would be born on the soil of the correct contrada. Things like gay marriage is interesting as well. Trends to move to travel to places like Canada or Belgium or Spain or the Netherlands or certain states in America. And I think these social changes, it's interesting the idea that, that travel may be stimulated by legislation. And we're going to come onto this in a second. There's gastro tourism, El Bulli, and even down um, uh, in, in parts of Cornwall where you know, one or two successful restaurants have created an entire boom of travel to that location. The Michelin effect in Tokyo, I think, is quite interesting, not least because you know, Michelin giving it so many stars has totally changed travel trends into Tokyo. Slow tourism and agritourism, people going and, and experiencing life on a farm. Um, can't think of anything worse myself, but still, horses for courses. Volunteer, uh, voluntourism, this notion of the new colonialism, 
uh, the critics say. But there's also a sense of people, especially those with time off, especially those who now can't get a job after university, delaying it for a year or so until the economy picks up, traveling to do good work elsewhere. Activism tourism, I think, is going to be interesting already. There are trends of people traveling to places like the G8 and the G20 to take direct action, to make a stand. People traveling to, say, California from around the world to protest against the uh, banning of gay marriage. It's, 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 it's not necessarily mainstream, but it's not negligible either. Debaucherism is interesting. The, the tedious line, what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas, has spread through to things like girlfriend getaways, um, sex tourism, not necessarily always the most pleasant, um, drug and gun tourism. I've traveled to America to shoot guns because why not? Um, and extravagapers, the rich and the sacked. Again, somebody mentioned this earlier. This notion of people taking advantage of some of the tough times. Diaspora tourism is another one, and I promise you we're coming to the end of the tourisms. Um, heritage tourism, people going back to their birthplace or to their roots, and this is especially true for countries like Africa and Ireland, especially for America, but also Poland. So many people came over here to work. There's this notion that they go back for religious events or for family events because you know, missing Easter may not be an option. Interestingly, suicide tourism, and I think it's quite hard to monetize, and if you're thinking about one-way tickets, I'm not sure how that works. Um, but joking apart, there is a real interesting moment, I mean, especially with a law um, on euthanasia uh, traveling for, having been clarified recently by the House of Lords and by the Crown Prosecution Service, and places like Switzerland being a key venue. And just as people traveled for abortions, it's not an, an, an impossible idea that um, uh, euthanasia tourism may be an option, and people are already going to parts of Mexico to buy drugs that they know can kill them, so then they have the option to take their own life in a country where those drugs will be banned. Landmark suicide is a strange little footnote to the travel industry. One in 10 people who committed suicide in New York between 1990 and 2004 traveled specifically to the city that never sleeps in order to end their lives. There's also dark tourism, which is a strange phenomenon. And part of this is linked to, say, the Holocaust and people going to um, the World War I war graves or to um, areas like Auschwitz and Belsen. And of course, the government has introduced a scheme where six formers from every school have gone to a concentration camp in order to sort of spread that information and spread the experience of those horrors. And there's grief tourism. On a local level, that's places like Wooden Bassett, which have suddenly become centers for people to travel to pay their respects to troops coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan but also people traveling to New Orleans post-Katrina and bizarrely to go to Portugal to visit the site uh, of the Madeleine McCann's disappearance. And there's battlefield and cemetery tourism. And this leads me on to something that I want to talk about, about taxonomy and the ordering and the illustration of information. Because how we order data, how we display it, and how we illustrate it changes the way we think about it. Anyone who's traveled to Washington or is familiar with the work of a designer called Edward Tufte, will be aware of the history of the Vietnam War Memorial. It was designed by Maya Ying Lin, and work started in 1982. It's built from black granite, and the granite was imported from Bangalore in India. It's sunk 35 feet into the bedrock. It's 493 feet long. And together, the granite panels contain the names of 58,226 American men and women who were killed in the conflict or who remain missing. Now, initially, there was some disagreement about how the names on this wall would be carved. It was initially said that it would be alphabetical. That would be the most democratic way of doing it. And then when the Department of Defense created a list, it was a two-inch thick phone book, and there were 600 people at least called Smith. And people thought this is, a, this is an incredibly anonymous and unfeeling way of displaying information. It seemed it seemed sort of bureaucratic and bizarre. And if you were trying to find your son or your grandfather, how odd to be trawling through Smiths. You'd never identify the man or woman who you wanted. Maya Yin Ling, the designer, was very keen to keep the names chronological by date of death, to tell the story of the war, to show how the number of deaths ebbed and flowed as the years passed. And this is what we see now. Now, chronological displays of the dead seem reasonable, and they seem very human, but it's not the only answer, and it only tells one story. Why not illustrate the war dead, for example, by race, 
to see which racial groupings suffered most, or by religion to see how many Jews died, how many Catholics died, or by age at death to see what generations suffered most, or by family links to see how many brothers died in arms, or by geography to see how many towns suffered. Why not illustrate death in war by income and social class and have all the rich people at the top and all the poor people at the bottom? Wouldn't that be a good way of illustrating the dead? Well, that's exactly what happened at the Menin Gate in Ypres in Belgium, which is the First World War Memorial. The names here are carved by regiment, by rank, and then by name. And the regiments are in seniority, infantry, followed by cavalry, followed by yeomanry, artillery, and engineers. Here, the dead of battle are listed by class and income. The richer you were, the more elevated in society you were, the closer to the top you were. It's as if the hierarchy of the parade ground had been lifted and etched onto the wall. It's as if the gates of heaven had a tradesman's entrance. Why does all information have to be listed in an alphabetical or geographical way? And how does the way we choose to illustrate information change the way we think of it and tell us about the times in which we live? To take an example from my father's field of work, he's a neurologist, it's fascinating to look at brain function and how functions like sight and speech connect with each other. At the moment, illustrating brain function, crucially, is illustrating the unknown. We just don't know how much of this works. And what's interesting is the way that the brain has been illustrated over time and what that tells us. This is a phrenology head. So this was the traditional sense that little bits of the brain represented curious things. So, you know, love, lust, hate, fear, speech, belief. This is picked up in Numskull's cartoon, little bits of the brain, speech department, voice department. And then, when electronics became the metaphor, the brain was illustrated as a circuit diagram. The brain is like a computer. The brain is like an electronic object. And people talk about short circuits in the brain because that's the metaphor they use, because that's what they're used to saying. More recently, topographical mapping has been used, so using maps, appropriate in the Royal Geographic Society, as a metaphor, and looking at topographical. This is the different maps of different parts of the brain of a human and a macaque. And of course now, people are very interested in brains as, as networks because computer networks is the metaphor. That's what we're interested in. Nodes, neurons, this notion of a network that gets stronger through synaptic change. So this is the thing. No one really talks about mapping because this is the new thing. But it may be that none of these are the actual metaphor. and The brain is much more like spaghetti or goo or soup and we don't really understand how it works. But the risk of presenting the brain like a circuit diagram, say, is that you think of it as a circuit diagram and it stops you thinking about other ways in which maybe brain function could go wrong. So the way we choose to present data absolutely influences the way we then think about it for good and for ill. To take another example, which is popular and well known, is the London Underground map. Now this is how the map looked in 1908 and it was topographical. So it basically looks like the geography, and the lines were drawn on the lines of the map. And then my hero, a man called Harry Beck, who was an engineering draftsman, in 1931 created this, which is the first draft of the London Underground map back then. It's based, as you can see, on an electric diagram. He limited the lines to straight arrows, straight lines, and 45 degrees. He did various things, one of which was to expand the center and to compress the suburbs. But the blinding eureka moment, which seems so obvious to us now, was that when you're underground, it doesn't matter where you are. Geography is less important than relative correlation to where you want to go. And this is something that a number of panelists talked about. We are underground online. It doesn't matter where we are, because we're underground. And all that matters is that the information we want is next to the information we want to go to, or the mapping is clear. And if we look now at the modern design, which is absolutely Harry Beck's map, and actually they put his name on it, which they took off some years ago. And I was one of the people who wrote to them to say, you should put it back on again. Um, and it's a gem of clarity. And what's astonishing is, if you look at the complexity of the two, it's the same map. You've managed to put on dozens more lines, hundreds more stations. You put the overground on, you can put 
buses on, you can overlay. Once you've got a great bit of design, it can be expanded, it can be modular, and you can do what you like. That's what it really looks like. <laughs> and it's a bit like an art gallery. If you take the difference between an art gallery, which has straight lines, clean, elegant, well-lit, and you compare it to an artist's studio, which is exactly how we think, the job of an information designer, but actually all of you here, is to take that, which is your product, but also the way most people think about a holiday. It's like, oh, what I want to go, I don't know. And to turn it back into something like this. Clean, straight, obvious, easy to navigate. But never, ever forget that most people's lives and brains is that. Certainly mine is. Which takes us on to the final thing I want to talk about, which is the notion of fuzziness. Consider the snooze button. People have long debated whether alarm clocks have a standard duration of snooze. And if so, why it's normally nine minutes. But the snooze button is an intriguing concept. It was introduced in the 1950s, would you believe? Now, what's happening nowadays is astonishing. Modern alarm clocks perform feats of horological accuracy that the pioneers of watchmaking couldn't even begin to comprehend. Most of your common garden high street alarm clocks are accurate to a second a year. There are some that take beams from satellites that are accurate to one second a millennium, a kind of an astonishing feat of accuracy for something you can buy for a fiver. But all of them have a snooze button. And the snooze button says, thank you for waking me to the precise nanosecond I received. <laughs> but now, sod it, I want nine more minutes. There is, incidentally, uh, an alarm clock called Clocky, which, when you press the snooze button, will roll off the nightstand and will then r run around the room looking for somewhere to hide. So you've actually got to physically get out of bed and, <laughs> and hunt for it. The snooze button is a perfect illustration of fuzzy design. And fuzzy design is where often very sophisticated functionality is subtly modified or entirely contradicted to accommodate human frailty and whimsy. And I think all of us who operate within the human sphere, can find ways of using fuzziness and just being open to the idea that actually what human beings say they want and what they actually want may not be the same. Fuzzy design is everywhere. Oops, we'll go back. It's in the eco-friendly worn once option in a washing machine. It's on the half load setting of a dishwasher. It's on the one cup function of a kettle. Certain pen cartridges have that little reservoir that you can flick and you know I've got half a side of A4. Toasters feature eject buttons that countermand the highly sophisticated timers. Heaters, household heaters, have a button that will give you, an, you know, a gratifying blast of heat, ignoring the incredibly expensive thermostat that was put in. Modern lavatories, I think some by law, have long and short flushes for different waste scenarios, as it's called. <laughs> Google's one touch one click, I feel lucky scenario combines fuzziness and optimism. And it's did you mean spell check reflects the fuzziness of hunt and peck typing. Certain intravenous drips have what's called a bolus button, which overrides the minutely precise amount of drugs when a patient in pain needs a sudden jolt of morphine. Weekly wage envelopes feature plastic windows so that you people can look inside. And there are certain new bank accounts that will roll up the kind of Interact, uh, will roll up so then the, 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 the loose change you get doesn't get given back to you, but gets put into a separate savings bank account, which somehow deals with our fuzziness towards loose change. The post-it note sits alongside Velcro as a triumph of fuzzy design. Here are two things that are designed to do exactly what they want, but slightly weaker than they might otherwise be asked to do, because they know that we want to put it and we want to take it off, we want to adhere and then re-adhere. And of course, the intermittent windscreen wiper speaks for itself. I'm still marveled at the idea that anyone came up with that. That's another go-home early moment. <laughs> Perhaps my favorite are the fences around construction sites. Fences like this are designed specifically to keep debris in and people out. But in the fantastically wonderful recognition of man's insatiable curiosity, they cut holes in them so we can peek in and look at the big diggers inside. And the very best ones have ones at a lower height for children. We're so used to fuzzy design that unfuzzy design can seem unjust. And this, is, I think, is very interesting for those of you in the travel sector. Parking meters, 
car hire firms and video rentals routinely smudge their, grace, their deadlines with grace periods so people don't feel cheated. The idea of going back to your car and the second it's gone, if you're given 10 minutes, you can't really complain. And when you're booking a flight and they say, listen, this flight, you can have it for three hours so you can go back and check and you know, have a second thought. It seems much better than when you go back, oh, sorry, it's gone up 300 pounds. It seems unfair. And we're used to designs, or rather we like designs, that allow a fuzziness, that allow for human frailty. It's why, since 1743, the boxing count has been introduced. So you're not just flawed, you hit the ground, you're out. It gives you a count of 10, because it seems unreasonable to allow someone to instantly jump to their feet when they've been beaten within an inch of their lives. <laughs> Uniquely, the Scottish legal system has a fuzzy, non-proven verdict in between innocence and guilty. That said, the baker's dozen, a very fuzzy 13 instead of 12, wasn't because people were being nice, it was because there were very strict penalties for short selling. Similarly, the glasses in British pubs have an extra bit along, so they have the line of it a bit, so you can allow your fuzzy head, otherwise you feel hard done by. In 2004, you may remember this, the online forums buzzed with rumours that the iPod shuffle function wasn't actually random. Look at this. And it learnt. Turns out, it didn't. But they actually put in a way of making it feel less random because people couldn't understand that random was random. <laughs> Fuzzy design can serve a higher purpose as well. In many Jewish households, Orthodox Jewish households, a bit of wall is left untreated because it represents the destruction of the temple. In Shinto shrines, sometimes imperfections are built in, such as a column being upside down, because they believe that perfection is associated with decline. And Persian carpet weavers traditionally would sew in an imperfection because only Allah is perfect. So with Selenie, taxonomy, illustration, and fuzziness, the idea is to change the way we think about data, to realize that how we present data changes not only how people view it, but how we ourselves think about it. And the notion of fuzziness, the notion that on the margins, people may not always want what they think they want. And I will leave you with my favorite line from Samuel Johnson, which is, all knowledge is of itself of some value. There is nothing so minute or inconsiderable that I would rather not know it. Thank you.